If you know anything about me, you know that I tend to take away a lot more from a gaming experience than I ever expect to. The Beginner's Guide, however, is pretty much built to send the mind racing and sets up any number of end goal interpretations that will cap off the experience for us. This is made pretty clear by the designer, acting as narrator for the duration of the game, beginning the experience by telling the players that he is interested to hear what we can get out of it and encourages the players to email their thoughts to him directly. I had no real intention of doing so at first, but oh man, did the game ever hit me where I live, and by the time the credits rolled I was so lost in my own brain going over what I had just experienced time and time again that, well, I'm still going over it a month and a half later. I was excited to learn of the game's pedigree upon booting it up, it having of course been developed by Davy Reedon of the Stanley Parable fame. The game consists of Reedon himself guiding us through a collection of independently created games designed by an acquaintance of his known only as Coda. The game as a whole plays out more like a presentation than an actual game, resembling the act of leafing through a person's creative diary, if you will. Coda's catalog of games spans eight years, and according to Reedon, this is the first time any of Coda's catalog has been presented on any kind of large scale. On the surface, each game appears to be something of a prototype, exploring an idea or concept rather than trying to be a fully fleshed out game experience. In the end, however, each one of these is an experience in of itself, and Reedon does a great job of making sure that we know it. There are recurring themes throughout many of the individual games, such as a supposed signature of Coda's comprised of three dots, hidden in most if not all of the games, I haven't actually found them all, a repeating door puzzle, and a lamp post positioned at the end of each game to signify completion. I must admit though that lacking the narration, I might find this concept too hard to get into, and in fact Reedon admits and readily makes it apparent that he is altering the flow of some of these games in order to make them accessible or marketable if you will. If you haven't already guessed, given this game's proximity to the Stanley Parable, yes there is a lot more going on here than what's on the surface. The Beginner's Guide, however, is much more directed than its spiritual predecessor, and now that I've played the game through several times, it is apparent that there is virtually nothing you can do to make the game deviate from its path. Instead, what is there for us to find is more like what there is for us to interpret, almost entering into a discussion with Reedon, who offers his interpretation of each or most of the chapters as this game progresses. The first moment in the game that really made me think, ugh, I'm gonna be making a video on this, aren't I, is a chapter called Stairs, wherein the player must ascend a staircase that gets harder and harder to climb as you go. There is a room at the top of the stairs, and by the time the door has opened for us, we have experienced an exponential decrease in speed, leaving us at an utter crawl, which we can assume is to be so daunting as to stop people from wanting to reach the goal. Our trusty narrator, however, is quick to fix the problem by allowing us to bypass this impediment, and when we reach the goal, we find a room filled with simple slug line pitches for game ideas. When I first came upon this room, I didn't really think much of it. I thought it was a strange abstraction, but I also thought it was kind of cute in a way. A room full of inspiration, boiled down to its base level, initially reachable only by obsessive dedication. Coda's original message really struck me. Reedon frames the message as, and I'm paraphrasing here, properly getting to know somebody takes a long time. We often don't get to see the finer details that make up a person until we have reached the top of the staircase. But I couldn't help framing it in my own mind as a reservoir of inspiration, seemingly always just out of reach. Coda places his idea room, if you will, at the top of a staircase that takes just long enough to climb for people to give up attempting to surmount, not unlike any discouraged potential creative giving up on their endeavors when they feel they've gone as far as they're willing to go. I mean, this seems like a pretty grade school interpretation right here, but the moment I first entered the room, I immediately thought back to all of the novels I started but never Never finished, the short stories I dashed off in a night but never really got to a point that I wanted to share with anybody, the half-formed lyrical ideas that were going to become the next prog rock epics for my band, and even scripts that I've started for this YouTube channel that have I've shelved years ago and counting now. Suddenly I'm thinking of Coda as an artist, struggling to fit his sparks of inspiration into a completed project, just like me. Following the stairs chapter, we come across a large paneled wooden door that demands a bit of a tricky maneuver to make it past. Upon opening the door, you find it leads to a narrow, dark space with billowing smoke blowing around your ankles, nothing to the left, nothing to the right, and only another door, looking exactly like the one you just opened, opposite you. In order to open this second door, you have to turn back, close the first door, and slip through to the other side before it's fully shut. Now we are cut off from once we came, and only then are we presented with the switch to open the second door, leading us into the next game space, often the closing room for Coda's games. Eventually, Reedon suggests that the door puzzle is Coda's way of closing 
proposing an idea, and moving on to the next observation or line of thinking. This, in my mind, is more or less on point, though I'm not sure it goes quite far enough. Each game has its own tale to tell or message to convey, and these specific ideas don't really appear from game to game, sure enough. The topics do go hand in hand, but even if the similarities are there, the conceit of each game is observed from a different perspective, if you will. But the door puzzles always stuck in my head throughout the game, and not just because they kept showing up. We first saw them after we witnessed the idea room, after we have experienced distilled directionless inspiration. Almost as though we have a starting point now, time to go find the doors. I began to see these puzzles not just as the end of ideas, although they are certainly that, but as the end of a project, creative or otherwise. When I stepped through each iteration of the door puzzle, I found myself reflecting on where they were positioned, what they were having me do, and what I was seeing. A door at the end of a game space born out of somebody's creative drive. Between the doors is only drifting wafts of smoke and cold darkness to either side, with the kicker of course being that we have to shut the door behind us, leaving us no way of ever opening it again in order for us to continue onwards. It's almost as if to say we can't stay in this project forever. How can we ever call a work of art a work of art, such as a game, a film, or an album, until we have finally put the finishing touches on that piece? We essentially close the door behind us, never to return to that creative headspace again, finding ourselves in the aimless void that is being between projects. And this is definitely something I sympathize with. There isn't really a moment of the day when I'm not thinking about this show in some capacity. When can I sneak in some editing time? What should my next topic be? My last video came out so many days ago already. Why haven't I started a new script? And if I'm not writing a new song for the band, or in the process of recording a new album, there is something missing from my daily train of thought. Finishing a new video for the channel, or finally playing a brand new song start to finish is the first door opening at the end of a latest endeavor. The directionless void between projects is both so promising and terrifying at the same time. The prospect is to give up our authorship, to call it finished, in favor of something that hasn't even come into existence yet, and is on us to make happen. There was a small twinge of that every time I stepped through those doors. The doors do in fact interact with the ideas present in each chapter of the game, it's as Reedon describes it. The ideas remain where they are, for sure, but the metaphor that they're framed within, specifically the doors, continues to grow and take on new life as Coda changes where we find them and what happens when we approach them. And that's when things start to get interesting. In chapter 10, Coda has us begin the chapter by exiting through one of the doors into a cold, dark valley in the wilderness. Wilderness that is, except for a solitary, modern-looking, comfortable one-story house in the middle of it. When we enter the house, the sound of the cold, rushing wind dissipates and is replaced with relaxing music. Inside, we meet a person who begins to instruct us to clean certain areas of the house that have become messy. The message here is even presented to us in dialogue. It's a message of self-care. A house is like one's soul. Take care of it, and it takes care of you. Reedon even acknowledges that this game takes place entirely within the dark space between doors, as though this self-care needs to take place when we are free from our working constraints. This is a concept I am all too familiar with, be it taking a few months off of rehearsing with the band after a CD release or a block of shows, or even just cleaning my room and apartment after releasing a video, though I will not profess to be any good at that last one. Yeah. We were lucky. This dark space was comforting and refreshing, but it can't last forever. The break has to end sometime, and so we move through the second door, having completed our objective in the dark space. Eventually we find ourselves falling through a void into a depressingly discolored door that is waiting and open for us after we have destroyed one of our projects, leaving us with nothing but an unceremonious plunge into the dark space. No puzzles, no special framing device, just an empty ending with no result, leaving us resentful at our failure, manifested before us as a broken machine that we are unable to destroy with our weapon, and the traditional lamppost that is our only grounding line in the chaos that is creation. Our inspiration, so to speak, is left powerless to empower us, and it just sits there, no longer fulfilling its purpose. But no matter how hard we try, we can never fully be rid of it. At one point, Coda even has us on the bridge of a starship, like the ones you might see on Star Trek, complete with a crew and everything, on a collision course with the door. There is no switch to open the door, and if we wait too long, we'll crash headlong into it, only for us to be brought back to just moments ago, headed for the same fate. We should have the tools we need. We thought we were prepared. We're on a starship, for goodness sake. But perhaps this project just isn't finishing properly, or perhaps we can't break through to the other side into something new. Writer's block has set in and we are helpless against deadlines, personal goals, any number of things that drive us, and the only way to save ourselves is to take a step back and ask ourselves the questions we don't want to ask. This is something the game literally has us do. We are tasked with saying something honest, and the impending doom that is upon us only pauses once we acknowledge that everything isn't sunshine and roses anymore. What is this doing to me? 
What am I accomplishing? These might not literally be the questions the game asks you, but they're certainly the ones I'm asking when I find myself in this situation. I mean, I've been trying to write this very script for almost two months now. I've walked away from it twice, unable to get my thoughts in order, unable to get it to a point where I could turn it into the video you're watching right now, for reasons very similar to the questions that the game makes you ask yourself. It's at this point where this game that I'm playing, The Beginner's Guide, is making me question my own creative endeavors and my motives behind them. Even trying to write this paragraph, though it might not seem like much, acknowledging that this is what I took away from this part of the game was a heavy moment for me. And you don't have to worry, I'm not gonna have a breakdown on video, I'm not gonna be making any unfortunate announcements about the future of my channel or anything. I just wanted to make it clear how much this game affected me, how much it turned a mirror on me and had me staring at myself by the end. And it's a powerful story, to be sure, one that not only captures the weight of what it's about, but also allows us to sympathize or even empathize with the characters involved. Now, my default reaction when considering the game as a whole is that Coda is an invention of Readings to serve this narrative. I'm not trying to state that or make anybody believe this. What this game's plot is about is not for me to re-represent, but an interpreted meaning is what I took away from it. Despite however much of the letter of this game I believe to be true, Readin makes it apparent that he is not a reliable narrator, having altered several of the games before our very eyes and even admitting to altering the house cleaning game to have an ending where previously there was none. It is even revealed to us by Coda at the end of the game that the lampposts present at the end of almost the entirety of Coda's catalog were in fact Reedan's creation, most likely implemented when Reedan showed Coda's games to other people against his wishes in order to make them playable by the uninitiated. I fully understand the friction between Coda and Reedan to be real, even if I'm not entirely convinced the events described in this game actually happened. At the very least, what is here depicts the struggles of the creative process through a calculated dichotomy represented by two states of mind. Coda embodies the the side content to explore within itself, its thoughts and feelings represented as bite-sized games, counter to Davy, who is much more intent on showing the world his deeper thoughts and feelings through his art having already admitted to altering the games to make them playable by the wider public, adding easily recognizable symbols and claiming that they are part of the original design, and even going so far as providing an ending for a game which previously had none, in essence sacrificing Coda's original design in favor of his potential audience. The moment that the game confirms that Davy is doing wrong by Coda, that we know for a fact that he is an unreliable narrator, is when we see that this particular game, as a collection of games, is a piece of its creator, shaped into a consumable product and offered to an audience solidifying its form, closing the first door, if you will. Our reactions are our own, and Davy knows that he has to live with that even if Coda rejects it. In the end, I think the beginner's guide is a message of encouragement that remains cautionary. There is incredible fulfillment in creating, but it is a taxing process, complete with highs, lows, and compromise that often overshadows success. We are ultimately working towards sacrificing our authority over our vision and surrendering to an audience. There will be someone adding lampposts to your games, even if it ends up being you, telling you that this most telling aspect of your work will alienate the audience and it must be changed, and that we need to remember that even if we successfully reject our early critics, pushing through our original vision, there is no telling what an audience will end up thinking or how they will interpret it in the end. And without an audience, how do we truly express ourselves? If we are willing to accept this, then maybe we will reach that room at the top of the stairs. Maybe we will summit step one of the creative journey. But we won't always be rescued by a trusty narrator. After all of this, mine is only a singular interpretation of a game that is pretty much built to stimulate unique thinking, and I've only used 30% of the game to explain it. There is so much that this game has to say, and so much to say about this game, that I wholeheartedly recommend players experience it for themselves, to form their own thoughts and interpretations, to notice things that I missed or put aside. And at the very least, it's kind of a trip. I mean, we talk a lot about emotional gaming experiences these days, and I gotta say, this one, it's right in there.